Hey there, everyone. Oh, the camera's a little bit out of focus. Well, let's see if we can fool it into getting into focus there. Yeah. All right. Um, hope, hey there, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Oh, the camera focus is a little bit off. That wasn't that way before, but you know what? I think I better fix it. So give me just a moment. Okay. All right, let's try that again. Hey everybody, welcome to Guru session number 14. I am sharply in focus now and wondering how you're all doing. How is your Corona hair? Mine is looking fresh. Yeah, it's because I'm just trying to make it look fresh. I haven't had a haircut. So today we're going to get into IzzyMap, our projection mapping tool inside of Isadora. And I'm really, this is really from the beginning. So if you already know IzzyMap, we're gonna probably cover some things you already know, but maybe some of the things that I'm gonna talk about in terms of workflow are things that are gonna be useful for you to learn. And so let's just go through the basics that we go through every time. First, there's a download link at the very top of the chat. Make sure to scroll up and download that. Even if you don't have a projector and if you didn't make the little model that we offered you to make on our forum, you can still use that file to follow along and see some of the things I did. The media is there that you'll need that I'm using. So you can get a hold of that by going to the top of the chat. It's really helpful if you subscribe and if you sometimes make comments, you know, down in the, in the YouTube thing, that helps us let people know about Isadora and know what you're excited about with it. So comments and subscriptions to the channel here are very much appreciated. And if you have questions about this particular topic, look at the link to the forum post. You can also ask your questions there and we can answer them for you if there's something that you didn't quite get or something that you want us to go over again, yeah? So the final thing is that when you ask a question, it really helps in the chat when you put it at sign Troikatronics and then you type your question uh, well you, and then type the word question in capital letters. So at Troikatronics, big question, and then type your question because that helps me see it more easily so that I can follow along. You can also mention feature requests. We keep track of those and log those. You can put at Troikatronics feature and then say that, okay? So I think that's it. I think we've gone through the setup of getting ready to go and we're ready to begin. So let's take a look at Isadora here. Let me switch to this view. So what you're gonna see here is that you see me and you're gonna see the stage here when I show it, yeah? But you're also gonna see uh, a live feed coming from, uh, coming from a camera that's looking at the little model we made. You can see it there. In fact, I'm gonna give you an even more exquisite view of that. There it is. So that's the model that we're gonna projection map on. And we provided uh, plans for that on our, uh, in the forum, you can download, there's a PDF and you can cut the pieces out and you can make it yourself. And you can uh, also have this very same model or some version thereof. You don't have to even organize the pieces in the way we did it. But that's what we're gonna work with today is this projection map. And so based on that PDF, right? I suppose I should show it, but I don't know if I have it over here, but you can see it on the form. It's just the outlines of the shapes that you see right now in the stage. So the PDF essentially looks like outlines of this, right? So, and that's actually somehow stretched here in, oh yeah, that's because I'm using a 14 by three, a four by three output. It just ignore that, but basically the PDF looks like that. That's what the pieces you would cut out. But if you look, if you go to the scene called Make a Mapping, which is the first scene we're gonna work with, the first two scenes are just for me to control OBS. If you go there and you go into the output menu and say Show Stages, you will see those shapes, yeah? And so basically we took that PDF and we created a, a image file from it. And right now you can see there's that image, that's the picture player here at the top, yeah? And then below that is a movie player. And then I've got a video mixer so that we can easily go between this piece of media 
and those masks. But take a look at that media. So there's one movie. Let's, let's full screen that too, even though it's going to be a little bit distorted. Let's full screen that. So this is the piece of media that I've prepared for this. And what you can see here, see the shapes? And then see where the images are? Right. So what I've done is I put several different pieces of video, and I did this in Isadora, actually, using the record stage feature. And I made this kind of composite movie that has, in fact, four different movies playing in it. But you see where I position them, right? And so this is the beginning of the workflow that I'm talking about. The idea is that you're going to create these set of masks, right? We're going to use that to create the map in IsiMap. That's not the only way to do it. It's one way to do it. But I'm going to show you this particular workflow because it gives a great example of how to, one way to do it and allows us to learn how to use IsiMap at the same time. But the companion to that, that mask, we're only going to use that mask, the, the, sorry, this image, the black and white image, to create our shapes. And then we're going to get rid of it. But it makes it much easier to trace and to figure that out inside of IsiMap to start there. Then later, when we're ready to actually see this, we'll take uh, this and we will fade it this way and you'll be able to see it. Of course, in your project, you, didn't, you don't have to have this set up. You can just delete the movie player, the picture player when you're done and replace it with the movie player, right? Okay, so we're ready to begin. I'll just check for any urgent questions before I... <laughs> it says it looks like craft work cover art. Yeah, we were saying it's kind of Bauhaus, isn't it? We like that. I'm a big fan of the Bauhaus. So it actually, the way we set it up in the little uh, setup down there is a little bit like, a, uh, it looks a very Bauhaus to me. All right, so we're ready to begin the process of creating this mask in IsiMap. So every projector actor, which you have one here in this scene, has an Izzy map built into it. So you can actually create many projection mappings using several projectors. Today we're going to just go through the basics and do one. And, uh, and so I'm going to start that process by double clicking the projector actor. So you double click it and then you get this warning because you're about to create a projection mask uh, map that will change the whole setup of the projector and it's warning you that you're about to do that because you don't want to do that by mistake, right? But you can say OK and then the Izzy map editor will open. And what you're seeing right now is the same TIFF image. It's a, it's a TIFF picture that has these uh, different masks in it. And our job right now is to create the individual slices. There will be five of them. One that is an outline that goes around each of these objects. Okay, So let's start. Right now, we're the other con or let me step back. The other concept you have to understand is there's an input. That's where you define like where you're chopping the image, right? So you say it's I'm, it's going to come from this part, and then there's the output, which can be actually keystoned and reshaped, and different things can be done to it. They are not the same thing. The input is where you are going to define this is the part of the image I want, and the output is how you map it to the physical object. You'll see that in a second. Right now, you can see here at the top, we're in the input section. You can change that by clicking it. So if you click that, you will move to the output. You click it again, and you go to a split view that shows you left and right, the input on the left and the output on the right, or another split view where the input is on the top and the output is on the bottom. And if you click it again, you're back at the input. Now I'm going to mention there's some really handy um, uh, shortcuts that we use because you'll see they come in super useful. It's good to know them. We have a table of this that you can find on our website. I'll make sure to find a link and put it in, the, in this uh, uh, description. But just as we go along, I'm going to mention them. The shortcut for moving from the input to the output and through that is the tab key. So if you're in the IsiMap editor and you hit tab, you'll go to the output and then split, and then split, and then back to the input. So if you need to get through this really quickly, just tab, 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 and you can rotate around through the various options, right? OK. So um, all right, so now we're going to define our first slice. There is actually one already defined. It's called rectangle 1. And by the way, don't forget, you want to be back in the input to do this, not the output. So make sure you go, you're in the same spot as me. It says input. 
What we're going to do is define the part that we want to chop out of this image. Those are defined by the white areas in this picture. That's the way we're doing this workflow. So what we're going to do is you can just start by making a rough estimate. Just grab this rectangle, move it to the corner, grab the next corner here, put it up there, put this one down here, and grab the final one. Whoops. I, let me undo. I didn't click. Click, and now you move that here. You'll notice that right now these will snap into place vertically and horizontally. Yeah? The snapping is turned on because this little magnet icon here is turned on. That is the snapping or the magnetism feature. You can turn that off by hitting letter A or by clicking the button. You can also just click the button. Sometimes you'll see it's very useful to have this magnetism feature turned off, but for making a square, it's actually pretty nice to have it turned on, right? The other thing you want to know is that holding down the option key and using two fingers on your mouse pad or the scroll wheel on your mouse allows you to zoom in and zoom out, right? So to make this really precise, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to, if I don't hold down the option key and I use two fingers, or if you have a scroll uh, ball that can go left and right, you can also move left and right, yeah? So I'm going to start by zooming way in to the top left corner of this first, whoops, way in to the top left corner of this first rectangle. Okay, you can see there, and I hope you can see in the broadcast because uh, the detail is very fine. I didn't quite hit it. So I'm going to click on this corner, and you can see it's highlighted. It's white, yeah? And I'm going to use the down arrow key. So down, 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 down. And I get it right to the edge, and I'm going to bring it in just a little bit. Now I think I'm really right on the corner. And then I'm going to use my two fingers to scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. You can see this one is off too. So we go down, 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 down. And now to make sure it's really square, I'm just going to try and drag it. Did you see it snap? Yeah. So I snapped it into place there. So those two corners are done. I'm going to go over here. And now I can just drag. It'll snap because we know it's perfectly rectilinear, right? So basically, I think we got it now. Nope, we need to move this one down. OK, we've snapped all our corners into place. And now if I zoom back out, you can see that we've made a perfect rectangle around this part of the image, yeah? Okay? So we've got the first slice, right? We did the first thing that we want to do. Um, so yes, if you, uh, someone's asking if I don't have a projector, does this part work? Because I, I'm, yes, it should definitely work. Um, just let us know if you find out, find that you can uh, make it happen. You, even if you don't have a projector connected, this should all work. If that's not working for someone else, let us know, okay? All right, so we have our first slice, but let's now go to the output, yeah? And also, I need to, I'm not seeing anything on the projector. I need to check, yes. So hold on, I'm using black siphon to do that. I need to do it again. Hold on one second. So black siphon is a tool to take siphon and send it out like this, and then we're going to do this. And now you're going to see that the, uh, I think, let me check that, that the image um, uh, is, on the, is being illuminated. I'm not seeing this in OBS, though. It didn't change. So something's going on with that. Um, hold on, let me. Let me change scenes just a second to see. Sorry, this is a complex setup that we're doing today, everyone. I'm, I'm hoping that, OK, maybe I just need help. Oh. All right, let me edit this really quickly. Sorry, everyone, just quickly change this. All right, I think I fixed it. Yes, OK. You can see now that there is the white square coming from the projector is hitting um, the entire uh, thing, the little model here, if you look on the right uh, of the image that you have there, right? So basically, if you hit the tab key now and you go to the output, 
Um, uh, so now you see that it's filling the entire screen. Now one thing that's important uh, for all of you is to look at this output thing down here. It says 1920 by 1080, right? And in fact, uh, that's probably fine for you. Most projectors that you would have your hands on are 1920 by 1080. But you actually want to go here and select the resolution of your projector. My projector is actually 1024 by, well, it's a 4 by 3 ratio projector. It's quite old. It's like time of corona, we had to throw together what we had. So I'm going to change my re output resolution to 1024 by 768, okay? That means that it's a 4 by 3 uh, ratio and that it should now match um, the projector itself, right? So you don't have to change that. I changed it so it's going to work for me because the reason to change it is if you set that resolution, aside from the aspect ratio sort of matching, Isadora knows when you use the arrow keys what one pixel is, yeah? So, all right. I hope that you can kind of see, you see the stage down here, it's just a solid white square. And there's IzzyMap over there. And so now from the output part, and if you have a projector and you made the model, you can try this too. We're going to get this into the left of the two uh, rectangles below the circle, okay? So the first thing I need to do for sure is I need to make this smaller. So I'm going to get this, this icon here is the um, scaling. This one up here, the circle, is the rotation. But I'm going to grab that scaling, and I'm just going to watch. Now, you're going to see me look to the left here, because that's where my model is. I'm going to ballpark this to get it about the right size, roughly. OK, that's kind of close, all right? You can see on the image coming from the camera how it's hitting both squares and kind of in the middle. Now what we need to do is we need to get the corners of this rectangle into one of those two squares. I'm going to do the left one, right? Now for this, because it's going to be at an angle, you'll see in a minute, it's good to turn the magnetism off. So here you want to go and click this button, or you can hit letter A to disable that magnetism. Because now what I want to do, I'm going to zoom in again so I can deal with this a little bit easier. And you'll notice I'm looking at the object, right? I need to look over here to see how it actually hits the model. I mean, I could also look at the projection that I, uh, the, the camera image that I see. But I'm going to look at the actual object because in a theater, that's in fact what you'd end up doing. Yeah? So there we go. Yeah? And what you may be able to see, if you look very carefully, I can't point to it with my cursor, but if you look very carefully, there's a little bit of white, a line, right below the circle and right above the square. That's actually a little bit of white that is bleeding below the actual physical object. So I haven't quite gotten the alignment perfect. So I'm going to click on that bottom right corner and keep your eye on that little sliver that's right to the, to, uh, below the circle, above the left uh, rectangle. I'm going to go up, 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 and you see that disappear because the part that was going beyond the edge of the physical object and hitting the back area is now on the object, right? So, of course, this is all a bit funny. I mean, this thing is tiny. It's this big. In a real theater, you'd be working with centimeters. Here, we're working with, like, millimeters. It's actually more tricky than doing the real thing. But basically, you saw the process. I roughed it out, and then I just look at it, and I'm adjusting it here to fit in to the object, okay? So that's it. We now have mapped our first uh, rectangle, and watch what happens. Now I can go back to the patch. Let's give it a try. So I go here to the mix amount on the video mixer, and I fade that up, and can you see? You see on the bottom, that's what's on the stage, right? There's the stage, and there's what's going on with IzzyMap. I know it's a little bit, it we should, would be nice to increase the contrast a little bit, but I think you can see um, that we've got the image coming from the video in that white square. So let's see, there's a few questions. Let me take a brief pause to look at them. Um, my object, I'm using a mouse and lost my object outside the window. How can I get it there? I'm not sure. Uh, you have to Skype, scroll away down and grab it. If you really can't grab it, I don't know how that happened. Just delete the rectangle. 
you can go, I'll show you in a minute, you can delete it and put it back. Oh, some, they said it worked now, okay. Uh, if I don't have a projector though, I guess I don't have the output. Well, you should have the output on the stage. Look at my stage here, or let's go full screen uh, in OBS here for a second. So there's my screen. That's what I see on my output, right? I mean, of course, this makes a lot more sense if you're actually doing it on the real object. That's why we posted the, re the model so that you could try and build it and try it. But even if you didn't do that just now, you can go get the model and download it and do that process for real later. But that's the actual output of the stage right now. And that's what's coming out of the projector. But when we see that on the actual object, you see that it's only showing up in the one square on the left there, right? Um, okay, so I'm gonna continue going. I, maybe Lucas, you can help with some of the questions that are appearing there about people having some difficulty with that. Um, uh, the, good question, why was that adjustment inverse? You corrected the bottom corner, but fixed the white line that was on top of the square. That's because the angle of the camera, you were seeing the white light coming, extending on the bottom because the can camera is looking from an angle from above. So it was a bit of an optical illusion. The white line looked like it was above the square, but in fact, if you were looking straight on, it would have been below, okay? All right, so that's our first, that's our first square, right? We got it handled, yeah? And, um, the process of doing those rectangles is the same for each of them. It's pretty easy, actually. So what I want to do is um, look, tell, me, tell me in this, how many of you have a model and a projector? I actually want to know if there's a more a majority or a minority of people that are doing that. That might change the way I go about this. But excuse me, <clears throat> just to try this a little bit, again, let's practice by going back to IzzyMap and let's do the second rectangle, okay? So I'm gonna hit the tab button, tab button, tab button, and now I'm back in the input, yeah? Oh, sorry, I wanna go back to my shape. So I go back to Isadora, and I scroll down the, here, I go to the mix amount, and I set it back to zero, so I've got just the white, the white things, okay? So now I can go back to IzzyMap and I've got the white squares again, okay? So let's make another rectangle, okay? So I'm gonna hit this button over here. This is how we make a new slice. It says new rectangle mapper. If you can make a triangle, composite, you'll see some of these later. The minus button is to delete them. So then I'm gonna just hit this button and now we have a new rectangle. And this one, the default is it fills the entire, um, the entire uh, uh, stage again. So we have to do the same process that we did before where we take this and size it down to, to, so that we can work with it. So let me zoom out here and I'm just again gonna rough it into place here. So I go here, I go here, and I go here, okay? Very rough and I'm gonna turn the magnetism back on again in a moment but let me zoom in now to this corner, make sure I've got it right on the corner of that. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Scrolling down to the bottom, make sure I've got it on. Now, all right, you can't see, I can see these little white areas that are extending beyond. I can see them a little bit more. Yeah, and I'm gonna turn this, go this in a little bit. Okay, sorry for the seeing you see the top of my head. All right, so I've got that mapped into place now. And again, I can go over and I can just fade this. And now you see that we've got that mapped in. And then you can see it also on the model, right? Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Someone has a model. Fantastic. Wow, that's great. Projector, not a model, Pico projector. Um, okay, so a couple people are using small projectors and models, so there's a few. The thing is, is that if I, uh, uh, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess I'm just gonna go ahead and take the time to do the third rectangle in here. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna do it quickly. I'm not gonna try and move slowly for all of you, just so we can keep things moving, all right? So let me go back. So I hit tab, tab, I'm or tab, I'm in the input again. Oops, gotta go back here. I wanna see. I mean, I wouldn't be switching back and forth if I was just designing. I would just be uh, doing the white squares and getting it over with. So, okay, another, another square. Going to rough that in. Okay, and now I zoom in. And let's get this really in the corner. I'm also going to maybe be a slightly less precise than I might be if I was really doing this. I hit letter A to turn on the magnetism to get that to snap. Go over here. Boom. Okay, that one's not quite there. I'll use the arrow key. And up I go to the top. Okay. And there's that. So I basically got that, that right white rectangle outlined now. We go to the output. Again, filling the whole screen. But here we just do the same process, and now I'm just going to grab them and move them. So here, whoops, woo, I went too far. So there's the top right corner of the top, the tall one. Here we go to the lower corner. I'm just taking a look over there. Um, super rough right now, just quickly getting it in the ballpark, as we say in English. Yeah, and I do this and get the bottom. Okay. Now, I will use the arrow keys, and I'm just going to, yep, that's good. That's good. This one's a little high. I need to go out and down a little bit. There, no, you can't see that edge. Too bad, but I can see it. I can see the white. So that, that white extending beyond the edge is a great way to tell if you're if you're on your map or not, right? Or you can see when you just get rid of that little extra white bleed, then you know you really are on the object. So you see, we've done it. We now have the third rectangle done, okay? Um, our feed frozen. Uh, is it frozen for you, any? They're saying it's frozen, the, the live feed of me. Any? Uh, is it frozen for you over there? They're saying that I'm, I'm not talking or moving or anything. At the moment, it's not. It was frozen before for a little bit. Um, okay, I guess. It's working again. All right. All right. I, there may be some, you know, it's the internet. It's crazy. People are watching Netflix. Who knows what's going on out there? Sorry if there was a big hang up. I hope it wasn't too long and you didn't miss out on too much. All right. Let's keep going though. As you can see, I don't know how much you missed, but I'll just reiterate. So I made a, another rectangle. I did this plus button to add the rectangle, and then I went in and uh, positioned it on the tall, thin rectangle on the left, right? Okay, all right. You missed rectangle number two. Okay, well, I'm sorry about that. Vagaries of the internet, all right? Okay, so now we need to do the circle, right? That's a different, uh, a different uh, item than the rectangle here. For this, we're going to use this button. And if you, everything has, a, by the way, a tool tip. And if you hold the mouse button and let it sit there for a second, you'll see it says New Composite Mapper. Those tool tips are everywhere in Isadora. So if you don't know what something does, a button or control, just point your mouse at it, and it'll give you a hint at least, right? So we're going to click that button. And it's actually, now there's two columns over here. Let's take a look at that. In the composite mapper, you can actually take several shapes, a circle, a triangle, a even more complex shapes you'll see in a moment, and add them together to make one bigger shape, yeah? We're not going to do that today because we're just kind of getting through the basic items here, but we are going to, uh, I just want you to understand that. So to see what I'm talking about, just briefly, I'm going to add a triangle and a circle. You see now that there's a rectangle, a triangle, and a circle, and you can take those shapes and combine them into a more complicated shape, yeah? But actually, all we want, if you did this with me, then do the same. We want to delete the rectangle and the triangle and just have a circle, because this is how we can make a circle in the projection mapper, okay? And if you do that, and you go to the input again, so hit use your tab button or whatever, you'll see 
that there's this circle occupying the center part of the screen, right? Let me center this and zoom in a little bit, okay? So like we did before, let's get it in the ballpark. Let's start with that. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna zoom it down till it looks about the same size as this thing here. And here you just wanna get that as centered as you possibly can. I'm trying to center that on the, the shape that we have. And then you can just use the zoom button to gradually, um, so there you go. So and it's a little bit off to the right, so maybe a little, I'll zoom in a little bit more. Uh, the final version, the scene that I've given you at the very end of the file you downloaded is really perfect. I really tried to take some time perfecting the map. I may be a little bit more shoddy in my attempts here. Question, is there a shortcut to recenter the map in the preview? Yes, uh, there are two things that you can use. These are, these are buttons up here. I was going to sort of get to that. But if you want to have something, the object you're working on, centered and expanded, click on this circle, for instance, and now I hit this button. That The button is called Center and Expand. The shortcut is letter E. It shows you that shortcut in the tooltips. So I hit letter E and it centers it right in the middle of the thing. And then this button here, center selection. So if I select a few things here, let me zoom out a little bit. If I take, if I select this square and this circle and I hit this button, it centers that selection, right? So you can either just center it, that's just centering, it doesn't change the zooming, or you can center and expand the selection. I should have said they're both the selection. They're not. Um, they're not. Uh, uh, they're not any just one object. If whatever you've got selected is going to get centered or centered and expanded. So the shortcut for the first one is C. That's center. And the shortcut for center and expand is E for expand. Right? Okay. So those are those buttons. These other buttons we'll get to in a minute. And we did the magnetism, and I guess hopefully it's obvious, the plus and minus are the zoom. And you can also hit uh, command minus or command equals, right? Or on Windows, control minus control equals to do the zoom. So, but I don't know, I always end up just using my mouse for that, okay? So, we've got the circle, and now again we hit the tab button, and there's our circle, and now we have to get this into position, just like we did the other stuff. So I'm gonna just take this, and I'm going to center it on my model. I'm going to look down there to see. Sorry for the crouch. And then I'm going to take the zoom button. And I'm going to zoom. You see, it's almost like a, a <laughs> you can see that bleed now really well. That's um, just like, it looks almost like an eclipse, right? But now I can really just take this arrow key and keep moving it. Now it's like a perfect circle. So I've really got it centered. And then I just have to just gradually take it down and now I've got the circle there yeah it's a little bit too small it's a little bit too high so let's whoops let's go down just a little bit uh, it's, it's still a little bit big so to get a finer adjustment I'm gonna zoom in here so I can really just zoom it a tiny bit okay so that's it I've done it I've gotten the um, the circle now centered on the model yeah okay so um, so there's a question I switched to a normal projector and I still and still only shows a big white square no matter how much I change the small one um, you remember there's the input and the output right if you add a new rectangle let's go to the input right so here we are at the input I add, I'm going to pretend that I need another rectangle. I add a rectangle and notice that um, on the output now, I'm going to have, no, it didn't do that. Why didn't it do that? It should, hold on. Let me make sure I understand what I'm doing here. So I'm going to add a new rectangle and go to the output. Yeah, it's, well, now what you're seeing because this of uh, the black is that it's, uh, that it's showing through the black. You see through to the, the background. If I say opaque, 
yeah, you, you don't see through it anymore. Anyway, the bottom line is that whenever you make a new item, it's going to be, you're going to do the input, but at first when you do the rectangle, it fills the entire screen. You have to then go to the output and resize it, right? Um, if, you, if you didn't catch that, go back and watch, go through the process. I mean, maybe I'm going a little bit too fast. I'm trying to go at a decent pace to let you follow, but let's keep going and see how we, we do, okay? All right, so the last step and the most difficult is to get this really uh, odd shape, right? Um, this requires that you're going to have to use some curved lines, obviously, to do it. And we also do that with the composite projector, okay? So here, we're going to use the composite button again. So I'm going to click this one. And we get a new composite with a rectangle. That's okay to start with. We're actually going to use a rectangle to start with. And like before, remember, make sure you're on the input. Make sure you're on the input right now. You've added this new rectangle and you're just going to drag that over to this shape that has a few different sides to it. And what I'm going to do actually is I'm just going to do it for the extremes of the shape here. All right. So let me go in and actually I want to perfect that from the beginning. You should do the same. So zoom in and get the four corners of that rectangle so it just gets the corners that we have there. Yeah. All right, so if you've done that, what you should have now is something that looks like this, okay? But what we need, obviously, we need more points. That's not enough, okay? So in all of the different shapes in the composite mapper, and this is special too compared to the other ones, the rectangle and the triangle are always a rectangle and a triangle when they're over here like this one, like they're just a normal rectangle. Those are always going to be a rectangle. But when you're using the composite mapper, all of these shapes in the second column can actually have more points. And to add them, you just simply have to hold down the control key on Windows or the command key on Mac. And now as you're moving along the edge, you'll see this point following you around. Well, I'm going to add a point by clicking and I'm going to drag it up there. And now you see we actually have added a point. It's no longer actually a rectangle, even though it still says that in the second column. But in fact, now we have another one. And we'll need another one for down here. So I'm going to hold the Option key again. And I'm going to click with the Option key down and drag this one into position. So we're almost there. But then we've got this curve. Now what? OK. Well, to do the curve, we have to enable curved shapes around this, okay? So to do that, when you've got the item selected, you see it's selected over here in the second column, you'll see that there's a thing that says Path Options Curved. So I'm going to click Curved. And as soon as you do that too, everything is going to go wonky with your model because you've added these points and it's now turned all of the points into Bezier controls. Now, if you've used a drawing program before, probably you know how Bezier's work. But basically, for each point, there are two what they call control points that you can grab and move around that change the curve. I can't do a complete uh, uh, description, really, of what Bezier's do, but let's just go in and try and make this thing fit, and then we'll be able I think you'll start to get the idea if you don't know Bezier's. But probably a lot of you, if you're working with graphics, you know something about Bezier's. Um, uh, there, this is a, you can put this under feature requests. There's a question, can you use the arrow keys to move the shapes? Uh, you, can, you can use the arrow keys to move the shapes in pixel steps. Are there keys to do the same for rotation and scale? No. They, you still have to grab them and do it. It's kind of a weird user interface issue. You kind of have to select that and leave it selected. So if you need a really fine adjustment of rotation or zoom, zoom way in, like, you know, go way in on it like here, right? And so that you are now making a very fine adjustment. That's my suggestion for that. But we don't have arrow keys to do the angle. Okay, let's go adjust our Bezier's, okay? All right, so... The first one, these look okay. This one's okay, but this one is not okay, right? We need to adjust this angle. 
So what we're gonna do is just go like this and just by, you can see that if you kind of like move the thing around and just kind of try and get that curve, you can spend more time on this and really get it much more perfect. I'm gonna, in the interest of speed, I'm gonna try and just get a rough approximation. So now I'm doing the control point for the point down here in the corner. I clicked on it and now I kick, click on its control point but that sort of messes up the top, so I click the top one again. And yeah, let's, let's call that good enough for jazz, okay? So by clicking this control point, yeah, I was able to move it around. You see what's happening there where I've got this bezier. And you just need to follow that curve. That's how you do it, yeah? Now, the, but the other two places are actually angles, and we need to fix that. So let's zoom, let's really zoom in on this one, yeah? So here are the control points for this corner. And oh, there's something else happening. When I move one control point, the other one moves. Can you see the little square moving around in opposition to that? That's because when you add a point like this, it assumes you're gonna make a beautiful smooth curve that you don't want a sharp edge. But we can have a sharp edge if we want to by changing the behavior of this point. So let's click on this point here. You do this too. So click on this point that we added and then look down here where it says Bezier point mirror. There's actually two options. One is unchecked. The second one means that the length of the two control points will always be the same. But the first one, this lock, means that the angle is locked. The angle is locked together like this, okay? And we uncheck that for this point, and now you can make a sharp edge. Now, if we click here again, and I grab the control point, you'll see here, by pointing that line straight down along the edge we want to follow, we can make a perfectly straight line. Same thing over here. If I find this control point, and I point it over here to the right, I can make a perfectly straight line. Now it's still not totally on the object because this one also has a bezier and its control point is a little bit off from the act of changing it to curves. So there we go. So now there is a nice straight line there. And now I'm going to go down and I need to do the same process for this point down here. Let me show you where I am because I'm so zoomed in. At the bottom right here, click on this point and then you go to the bezier point mirror and you uncheck it. And now we can do what we did just a moment ago. You can go here and you can adjust this so that you have a nice straight line. If you really want to make it perfect, you'll, you're going to want to zoom way in on it and really see that that control point is lying right on top, right on top of the shape there. Yeah? So there we go. That's that one. That's that one looks good. And now we go up a little bit and control this. So there we go. I think we did it. I think that we've got our shape, right? Um, all right. You can, there's a question, how can you add more bezier points and sh in the shapes and add a feather? You can add more control points by holding down the control key on Windows or the uh, uh, command key on Mac and going along the edge. This only works for the items in the second column of the composite mapper like here, yeah. Feathering, we do not have that option yet. That is something that is going to come. Uh, we, tried to, we tried an implementation that we weren't happy with. We're working on it. I think you can expect something about that by the time we get to the fall. And everything reopens and we can all do shows again, right? Okay. So, safely reopens. Very important. All right. But we've made our shape, right? So now we have this odd shape. And the final step to complete our map of our little model is to go here. We're going to click on this to go to the output. There's our weird shape. And I'm going to get it. Oh, wait, it's in the wrong orientation. So because you can see that it needs to be rotated. So I'm going to rotate this around like so. Get it into where it's like that. Whoops, wrong thing. All right, and now we can get it in the ballpark here. I get this corner aligned. Yeah, and then 
you can just take, now this is a keystoning object where you can take the four corners and just keystone it into place. This would be the way that I would choose, is it too big? It's too big, isn't it? Sorry, I have to look over here for a second. Yes, it's still too big. Let me zoom it down a little bit. Get, try one more, getting it lined up. I'm just kind of roughing it out. I don't know, you can sort of see the, the bleed there. The bleed isn't too much right now, it's pretty good. So we're pretty close, and now to finalize it, I will zoom in a little bit on this, and I will just drag that keystoning corner a little bit. You don't want to do this, you don't want to go too extreme with this if you don't have to, but a little bit just to get it to settle into the model. A little bit down, this needs to be a little bit down too, and in, and whoops, a little bit up. And one more corner. I'm not going to make it super duper perfect, just again in the interest of time. But that's pretty darn close. Okay, so that's it. We've actually completed our mapping. And as you can see, the map, all the elements in the map are lit up, right? So let's just remember, again, I'm going to close this window. And I'm just going to uh, show you, let's just remember what this movie, the source movie, looks like. The one that I prepared for this projection map, right? Just going to open it in QuickTime Player for a second, right? So let me make it a little smaller. So I've defined these areas. The top area is the, is the one that will be the, the, the two squares like this. Obviously the tall one where you have the kaleidoscope is the tall one. The eye where the pupil is the round one. And then this Venus flytraps is the uh, other image, right? And I put those all into position based on that mask, the mask that we just used to be able to make all these shapes for our projection mapping, right? So now, if I go back to my patch and I content on the model, on the left is the kaleidoscope. The thing with the angle is one single image that is kind of bent at an angle. The pupil of the eye is in the circle, and the Venus flytraps is over to the right. Sorry, the picture quality on that webcam is not the most amazing, but I think that you basically get the idea. And below that, again, remember, this is what the stage looks like. I mean, this is what's actually being sent to the projector, right? And so now you can see how it's all a little bit strange. Like, the, you see, because of the angle of the projector in relation to the objects, the two that are next to each other go like this, right? But none of that matters. You just have to move those corners until they fit into the shapes that you're going to projection map on, and you've done it, right? So that's it. We went through the whole process now of doing this, and I just want to go back, and I want to show a few other nice features inside of the projection mapping system, because that process is the basic workflow. And again, there are different ways to do it, but the way we did it was we made, we got, you know, it might be that a designer is giving you a plan that has these shapes on them that is going to be in a show. Or maybe you're the creator and you know you're going to make these screens in these shapes. You make a little model, you make a printout where you've got that, and you can actually make this model and prepare to go to the theater by going through this process, but you trace those shapes, you make them white and trace them like we did, and then you position them where they need to go, either on a model at home in preparation for showing up in the theater to go faster, or to be able to um, just do it in the theater if you've got the time. One thing that's important to remember, um, we've got this set up perfectly right now, right? Everything's centered and perfect and whatever, but you know, all it takes is a lighting designer that needs to, or a technician, to go up into the grid and hang 10 lights on it that weigh something, and the grid goes like this, which is the grid that your projector is on. Suddenly, your projection map doesn't match anymore, right? You know, this is something that you really have to be careful with, that, you know, just because you've set it and it seems like it's totally solid does not mean it's going to be in the right place tomorrow. Checking these out and making a fine tuning every day is probably something that either you or an assistant who's running the show needs to know how to do. But for sure, you want to be able to put the projector and the objects on the most stable 
solid uh, uh, you know, surfaces or hang them from the most solid places that you can so that they're not moving. Even sometimes if there's a huge amount of vibration like in New York City where there's subways going underneath the buildings all the time, they can shake them out of position in fact, right? So that's something that you need to think about and look into is to really make sure everything's solid and doing a touch up is something you should think about doing. Let me answer a couple questions before we continue. Um, can we name our mapping slices if we want to keep track of which slices go in which areas? Yes, I didn't get into that, but I'll do that in a moment. Um, the advice is to have only one movie file for all of the surfaces, right? That means if I want to move the video in the circle to be more in the center, I will have to re-render the movie file. Not really. If you know that it's a circle and it's a square, it's in, because here, let's, let's, let's actually look at that first and then I'll do the naming thing. So here's my output. I just opened, I double clicked the projector. That's how you open Izzy Map, right? And, and um, so there's the output, right? And I hope you can also see the model there, right? Look, if I wanna move this someplace else, I mean, it's not on the model anymore, exactly. Well, here, let's move it down to where it's, see, I put the eye where it says Izzy Map, right? I didn't have to change that movie in the slightest because there's still a square of video that is being turned into, cut into a circle and positioned somewhere. So uh, you don't have to do it that way. But the, the wonderful advantage of what's special about Isadora, which I, you know, I can, let me illustrate it in this way. Uh, I undid that, by the way, to make it back in the right place, right? Let me do this, just as an example. I'm gonna duplicate this projector. I'm gonna save my file so I can get out of this. In fact, let me just duplicate this whole scene. I don't want to mess it up. Okay, duplicate the projector. So watch what I'm doing. I'm going into our finished projection map. I'm deleting the circle. Okay. All right. Actually, let's name them. Let's, before I even do this, let me undo that. Let's answer Lucas's question. All right. If I double click this projector, let's give our, our things names, right? So if you double click any of the slices, so that's the left rect, I'm gonna call that for left rectangle, double click, right rect, tall rect, circle, I'm gonna call this Bauhaus in honor of the Bauhaus, okay? So you can give names to your slices so you know what's going on, right? Um, and so that's easy. And so now I can do what I was about to do. I'm going to close the projection mapper again. So I duplicate this projector, right? And watch what I'm doing. I'm going to go into the first one, delete the circle. Okay, circle's gone from the first projector. Open the second projector, and I'm going to delete everything but the circle, right? So I delete now. In this, project, in this projector, I have a circle. And in the other projector, I've got the other shapes. And look, I can come in here now, I'll duplicate this movie player, I'll pick a different movie, and voila, now I've got a different image of these people walking in the circle, right? So this is a very powerful thing. And I wasn't gonna get too deeply into this idea of using multiple projectors, because I really wanted to introduce Izzy Map to people that maybe hadn't used it before. But, Every projector is a projection mapping tool, right? And every projector can have its own slice. And if you wanted to do it where you had a piece of content and a slice, one slice in each projector to create your whole projection mapping, you could. It may not be so convenient though, because then to navigate back and forth, you're gonna have to open every projector that has every slice in it and adjust it. There are other ways that you can composite multiple videos into a kind of composite that, like the one you saw at the beginning. You can do that actually in Isadora. So the thing about Isadora is, you know, when people ask a question, the answer is almost always yes, you can. There's a million ways to go about doing this. You, if you wanted to composite that video, not beforehand, but live, you could, right? Or, you know, uh, one reason you might wanna do this is let me delete this for a second. And I'll just do another quick example. I'll go to live capture settings and I'll turn on my internal webcam. Let's see if I can do this, the same one that I'm coming from. Can I do that without messing it up? 
So there I've got a live feed of me again, and I take the video uh, in Watcher, which receives that live feed, bump it up to the projector to make a link, and now, if I put my face in the right place, now I'm in the projection map. So now I've got a live image. That would be a really good reason to separate these out because now you've got two very distinct kinds of content. One is a movie and one is a live feed. And by using multiple projectors, you can actually do this, right? All right. So let's see. I think I answered that question. I answered the question about renaming. Let's go back to the first scene though, because I don't know if you followed along and did all that where we just have the other things. I'll name them again though so we know what's going on. Left rect, right rect, tall rect, circle, and Bauhaus. Okay, so there's other controls that show up down here that you can use when you click on these different slices. So for instance, there is a blend mode, right? You know the blend mode from the normal projector if you've used Isadora. Then, um, uh, so we can change the blend mode just like the normal projector. We have additive, transparent, and opaque. Um, refer to our basic tutorials. Go, go watch the basics the, on our tutorial playlist if you don't know what that is. But anyway, that's uh, what that does. And then there's an intensity input. So actually, I can make this fade out. Like if I don't want it to be fully uh, at full intensity, I can do that, right? So that's an intensity slider. If you like, you can open that up and you can actually colorize it by doing different color intensities for the red, green, and blue channels. I don't know if anybody uses that. But super important is the orientation. You can see here, I can flip this video around left, you know, flip it horizontally or vertically or both and you can have, you can get this done no problem, right? Okay? All right. This reset output button will reset it to its full screen version. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to mess up what I've got, right? So that's what you see when you click on the rectangles and triangles, but when you click on the composite map and you click on one of the items in the right column, there are more options, right? There is this curved checkbox. Uh, the circle already does this, but let's look at our Bauhaus image that we made where we made the beziers and stuff. So there's this curved option. The granularity is how many steps in the curve if you need it to be a finer thing, but 16 is usually pretty good, right? And then when you click on a point, uh, I have to go to the input, sorry. Here I am in the input. If I click on a point on that bezier, I mean, I'm sorry, a point on that composite shape, I get even more options, right? The point adjust, you can actually see that in other points that you click on, allows you to put it on a particular pixel within the entire image. That's why setting that um, range that we were talking about is important, yeah? Um, but the Bezier point mirror business that we looked at before, you learned about the lock. The lock is when, when they are locked and you two one, the other one's gonna mirror it. And then the other one with the length is means that if you pull one this way, the other one's gonna go to mirror it exactly. That's to help you make really smooth curves. So these extra options down here only appear when you've got, um, when you're clicking on a point. You won't see those if you're just clicking on a shape up here, like here if I click off the shape, right? You just see this path options things. The other thing that's important to go into, and um, I won't give a big example of this, but there's this thing called sub slice options, right? Right now it says add. Let me do a brief example just to let you see what's possible. I'm gonna add a new circle. Now we have a giant circle that just appeared, but I don't want it to be giant. Uh, I better go back to the, I think I better go back to the these. You can see a little bit better what I'm doing. So here's a circle, right? And if I put it here, um, you won't really see anything because of the shape, right? But what I want to show you is, for instance, because that was adding on. Yeah, I better go back to the video. I, no. Yeah, all right, let's see. I'll fade on the video just so you can see. Can you see here on the stage? You'll have to look at the stage. I don't know if you'll, oh no, you can see it on the backdrop of the model there. You can see that this circle, whoops, this circle uh, that I've added 
is being added. Do you see it above, just above the, the, uh, the map on the, on the thing? But here's what I really wanted to show you, one thing that's kind of nifty. If we see this shape, and I put the circle inside of it, right? So the circle is now inside. If I select both, you can see. If I select that circle alone, and I change the subslice options from add to subtract, now it cuts a hole into the shape. And do you see the black spot now? If you look at the model or if you look at the stage, it's a little small to see. Or here, let's do full screen on the stage. That'll help here. You see that I now have a hole inside of that uh, object over there, right? So that's what becomes possible with this. You can also subtract or add. That's how you start combining multiple shapes into a much more complicated, larger shape, OK? OK. So that's pretty much it in terms of the options of the different slices, yeah? And the other things I wanted to mention, there's a few setup controls down here on the bottom. We already talked about the output. You also just have a zoom where you can say, I want to zoom to 150%, so you can you know, jump there if you want, right? But this is kind of useful, this background color. This determines how it like shades the background when something is not part of a slice. Right now, it's not very, that's not so strong. Let me, uh, let me get this centered for you so you can see everything, right? Here's all the shapes. Right now it says black 25%, but look what happens if I say black 75%. Now you start to see the background more strongly, and you can also choose white or red or a checkerboard to help you understand where are my slices ending. Whichever one of those you prefer, you can choose. Uh, I'm kind of partial to the red one. Uh, that helps me sometimes see what's going on. So that's a super helpful option to be able to understand what part is actually being seen and what part is not being seen. Of course, that doesn't show up on the output because this thing only matters about what part are you chopping away. So this is for the input, the, the background business that I just showed you. It doesn't show up on the, on the output. Okay? So the very last thing I want to show, I want everyone to go to the output, yeah? because there's this really handy feature that in a map like this that isn't terribly complex, you might not even use, but there's a solo feature. And this works a lot like the solo feature on an audio mixing console. Remember, I was trained as a composer, so I think that way when I make stuff. And um, you may have noticed over here this little S on the end of each slice, right? Well, if you click that, nothing happens. Let's click, let's just click the left rect and the right rect. And you see it's illuminated there, but the image didn't change at all. But if I go click the solo button, now you see they're green and we don't see anything else. So in other words, these things on the right on a mixing console, we would call that solo select. You can press this button but then there's a solo master, and only when you press that button does the solo take effect. So what's nice about this, because the shortcut, as you can see from the tooltip, if I go to the solo button, the shortcut for the master is M. So if I want to toggle between seeing every slice and only the ones that I've checked the S for solo on the slices, you just hit letter M. When you have a really complex map and you're fine-tuning the points, that can be super duper helpful, right? So, and you can change this at any time. I just deselected nothing. The solo master is on. You see that it's bright red to help you see that. And if I hit the circle solo and the Bauhaus solo, now I'm using those, right? Again, letter M always gets you back to no solo, but pressing them um, down does that, right? So that solo feature when you have, um, you know, dozens upon dozens of these slices can be incredibly important, okay? So now's another time for me. I'm about to change into a different topic for a little bit because we've actually looked pretty much, briefly at least, at every part of it. We looked deeply at, you know, creating these masks and getting them into position. You saw how they showed up on the model, but I want to just cover a couple of other small points before we kind of finish this up. So now is your chance. If you've got a lingering question or something that you need to know, I'm just going to check back here to see if something came up. Um, just 
just some I guess you guys are helping each other out here with some dialogue I think people are having questions and they're working with it okay um, all right so okay um, if there's no more questions with the, the at the moment what I wanted to show one other super nice feature is that there's actually and something really special to Isadora I think is that you can modulate the different slices in different ways let me show you what I mean so if I go back I double click my projector again and I go just to make it clear to the input right so there's all my slices right if I go to this left uh, this is the left rectangle and I right click it a pop-up menu appears with a bunch of different options and it says publish left rect the name of the slice and then it has offset X, offset Y, rotation, scale all, etc. There's a whole bunch of them. Let's just do the most, the one you might be the most likely is the intensity. So what I want, before I choose it though, I didn't choose it yet. Look here at this projector actor. It ends with stage. That's its last input. Now I'm going to go to this slice and say publish left rect intensity. And as soon as I do that, you'll notice the projector actor has changed. There is a new input that says left rect intensity and I can go here now and you can see it on the stage and also on the model. I now have a real-time input where I can fade that particular slice in or out using real-time control potentially, right? To show you what I mean, here's the, the final map, right? But now I've got five uh, wave generators making the, each individual slice fade in and fade out. Let's go to our actual video by changing that. And you'll see now that each slice, because it's being controlled by a wave generator, can fade in and out. So if you needed the ability to independently control them just to get them turned on or turned off, that's one thing you can do. But there's a lot more that you can do with this if it makes sense. Now, for instance, one thing that you can do, uh, if, you're, if you have a model, if you have got a stage design that's fixed, this might not be so helpful. But I'm going to also, for instance, publish on this circle one, the offset X and offset Y. So now I have those two, and they've been added to the bottom here. And you'll see that when the, when the eye is visible, it's fading in right now. I can actually now move it just like I would do with the normal projector with the horizontal and vertical inputs, right? So I now have the ability, it's faded out again, but I have the ability, you see it coming in there, to move that slice around. Or, let's do one more, might be nice with the eye anyway, the rotation. So here, I can now take that slice and I can see how I can spin the eyeball by... I can, woo, googly eyes, it's crazy, all right? So this feature is pretty interesting, and especially the one mapper we're not going to really look at today, but I'll just mention, is this uh, grid mapper. The, whoops, I shouldn't have done that, excuse me. The grid mapper allows you to kind of warp an image, and that one, I have, I've actually never used it for projection mapping, but I've used it to like send in interactive control and kind of make the image warp in this really nice way, right? Um, so, this ability to publish the image, also if you don't need it, if you decide you don't want to have it, you just click on it again, and you say unpublish rotation, and now it removes that from the projector, right? So see, the rotation's gone now because I did that. So that's something really worth exploring, and it is something very special to Isadora, the fact that you have this ability to manipulate the slices, their position, their size, their um, rotation. All of this can be done in real time for each individual slice if you want to. I mean, you may end up with a very tall actor with a lot of inputs and outputs, but it's possible to do, okay? Okay, now... The, the last one, because this question comes up a lot. So that's great. We have our one scene here, and we've got it all mapped in, and it looks really nice, and everything's cool, right? And I should fade this. Actually, let me unpublish. I want to go back to the basics here. I'm going to unpublish. Oh, what have I got published? Oops. 
Ah, yeah, unpublish the intensity. Okay. So, all right, there's my map again. And so, what if you have a lot of scenes in your show and you need to be able to edit this? If it's in every projector, that's kind of a bummer because you would have to then, in theory, go edit every projector actor in every scene to make it change because maybe we move the model, maybe we rotate one a little bit, right? There's a good solution for that though, and that's to use a user actor. We did a whole guru session on user actors. Please go watch it if you haven't, but I'm still gonna show you this technique. It's pretty simple and it's a great thing to know. So let's say I'm gonna create a user actor. Again, if you don't know user, user actors, just follow along and try this, but also watch that tutorial because user actors are very powerful. So I'm going to disconnect, I'm going to disconnect the link here and I'm going to cut my projector that has the beautiful projection map in it. Double click the user actor so it opens. It's like a macro, right? And then you paste. So now here's our projection map. If I double click it, you'll see that all the slices, if I highlight them, they're still there. They don't have any video right now, but they're there, right? So now you want to add a user input. These are special because in Isadora, whenever you see an input or an output with a green dot, it looks like a number. Normally you can't connect a number to a video signal, but the green dots are special. That means they're mutable. They're like alien mutable things that can turn into anything, shape shifters. And so if I connect this user input to the video input of the projector, boom, it's now a video input. So you, these user inputs, you'll see these in other actors in Isadora, these, act, these inputs or outputs that, manip, that turn themselves into a different kind of data. For the moment, that's all we need is the user input and the projector because we're not going to manipulate any of the other parameters, right? So now I'm going to hit this red X here in the top corner of the tab and it's going to say save and update all. Do you, what do you want to do? There's other options. But we're going to say save and update all to save our user actor. And now, whoops, I double clicked it again. If I bump that up against the video mixer, everything's back to the way it was. So we have this tiny little actor and inside is our projection map, right? Okay. Now, let's... I'm going to duplicate this scene. I'm going to call it Here's a copy. Okay? So that's your second scene and in fact what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a different movie. I'm going to change the movie player to movie number one and now the movie itself, if you look at the thumbnail here, is just this people walking video. It's just people in a city walking. And now that's what's being mapped. That single chunk of video is being mapped onto our object, right? So one thing that's cool is because now the, project, the, the two projection mappings in both scenes are exactly the same. If you click on the first scene, notice that I have it set down here for a three second dissolve to the next scene. So I hit the space bar and watch the, uh, the, the model. And it's gonna crossfade into the people walking, right? So because the first mapping and the second mapping are exactly the same, that works. Okay, but what if the director says we need to have the circle a little bit higher? Okay, now I'm, I'm not going to go over to the model and change it, but let's just say that that or you as the creator decide I want the circle a little bit higher. Let's say you've got 30 scenes, right? But because the projector with the projection mapping is inside the user actor, all of the user actors that are the same, that are copies of each other, when you change one, you automatically change them all. So here's what I mean. Let's go back to the first scene. I double click my user actor, double click my projector. There's the projection mapping. I go to the output and I'm just going to move the eye up a bit. So you'll see that it's not, yeah, let's move it up a bit. So you'll see that it's not centered anymore, right? If you see that in the map. Okay, let's say that that's perfect. That's how we want it. So now I close the mapper and then I close the user actor and it says save and update all. So I do that and okay, it's still that way. You look at the eye in the model, it's above the circle. But now when I do my crossfade into here's a copy, the other one is exactly the same because 
user actors, when you, when you copy and paste them, they all know that they're actually the same thing. And whatever you change inside of a user actor changes in every copy, right? So by putting the projector actor inside of a user actor and using that in all of the scenes of your show, if you're working in this manner where you've got a set and you've got all these shapes and you've got to have it you know, perfectly matched, that way you only have to edit it once and every other thing in the show is going to be exactly the same, right? So that's, that's the advantage of placing that in a user actor. And one other handy thing, I'll just go in. We added this at the request of a user because it was such a good idea. You know, if you don't know it, the eye icon is very important in Isadora. That tells you that there are inputs or outputs on the actor that are hidden because they're not so often used, but nevertheless are important. The reason we do that is to make it so you don't have actors that are as tall as a skyscraper, right? Um, but in this case, uh, you know, it's always good when you see that eye, if you don't know what's in there, double click it to find out. So that's what I'm gonna do because one of the items is this little input here that says Izzy Map. I'm gonna check that and say okay. And a new input is gonna appear on the projector that says Izzy Map. So I'm gonna add a user input and I will connect that by like so. And it changes its name even to say Izzy Map, and it changes into a trigger because they're both the uh, Izzy Map input is a trigger. So then I say, uh, and notice by the way, I'm in the scene called Here's a Copy. Important. So I say Save and Update All. Again, I've edited my user actor, and now I have a new input, Izzy Map. And what that allows you to do is you can just click it, and the Izzy Map window opens. So you don't have to actually open the user actor to get at it to edit it, right? So that's just a handy tip for being able to get in and edit your Izzy map thing. But notice if we go to make a mapping, that user actor has a new input just like the other one. So this process about what goes on inside extends to if you add new inputs or outputs, it will add it too. So this technique of putting the projection mapping into a user actor is how you can kind of have a global mapping that's the same for every scene and so that if you make a tiny edit in one you will have them in every scene that you need all right let's see what's going on in the discussion because basically i'm coming to the end so now is your chance you know to find out anything you really wanted to know um would it be possible to add a published video input is he Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, would it be possible to add a published video input so you could have a real-time effects on each mapping? Yeah, that would be possible, but um, I don't know. Let's, let's talk about that as a feature request. You can put that in the feature request section of the forum. I mean, certainly, if you were compositing the video yourself using the Matt actor, for instance, would, or Matt++ plus plus actor, you could take several videos and composite them. You could apply the effect on that video that's in your composited video, the one like we did as a movie today, but could be live, then you could apply the effect. So that's a workaround. It's not so hard. You can make that happen right now by doing it that way. You create a, a surface with some videos on it and one of them maybe has an effect, yeah? Okay, Annie would like to map googly eyes on all of the buildings. That's a really good idea. We should all do that. Um, um, just going down the list. I think that there's no one saying question here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Sammy Chen says, Mark, my brother finally said he would choose Izzy Map over Mad Mapper now. Yes! Okay, good. Um, okay, so that's what I wanted to cover, and I didn't see... Oh, here's a question. If you wanted to adjust parameters on individual projectors for each scene, i.e. the width, what is the best workflow? Well, the thing is, you probably wouldn't want to do that with the projection mapping thing, because... Let's, let's see now. I mean, they're all inside of the user actor now, but let's go to the, 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 this map here, right? So here's the map. It's all inside of our, our stuff on stage. It looks great. If I start changing the width, nothing's going to fit anymore, right? It's now, it's now not in the objects. 
you can do that. I mean, you can also use IzzyMap just to create a kind of design, a kind of like thing where you're compositing video in this kind of abstract shape. In that case, doing those things maybe makes sense. But if you're actually projecting onto the stage, I don't know that changing the width and height independently in each scene would make a lot of sense, right? I mean, on the other hand, let's say that you needed to make a shape that was very odd, like the Bauhaus shape that we have, right? And that that was tracking someone on the stage, so it's moving around on a big, big like projection in back. Then using those horizontal vertical position with height zoom and the projector, yeah, that would make some sense to me in that situation, right? So it really depends on what you want to do. Um, uh, so I hope that answered your question, uh, Callie. I, um, uh, you know. I'm not sure if that's what you meant. It, clarify if it's not. Question from Dimitri. If you use a virtual stage, how are you putting FX on chunks of an image that has multiple videos baked into it? Well, I would probably put that on the place where you send the video to the virtual stage, like before it gets to the virtual stage. So video source, video effect, and then you, mat, you, you use a projector to put it on the virtual stage. So the effect is before the virtual stage and then you've got the combined video in the virtual stage. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, virtual stages are a thing in Isadora where you can create uh, an imaginary stage that's not connected to a projector and send video to it. So that's kind of a more advanced question. But I think that uh, hopefully that helps, right? Um, yeah. So, all right, I think we're winding down. I'm still looking for any urgent questions. I'll just remind you at the end of the video to subscribe to the channel, talk to us on the forum, tell us what you need, what worked, what didn't work. You know, we are always looking to hear from you all the time to make the program better, to find out, uh, you know, what we could do better or what things are confusing. That's actually super important to know. To say, I was really confused by, that's a thing for us to hear to make the program better, right? Um, so, and then, you know, comments on the YouTube channel, that just helps us kind of promote and let the world know how great the software that so many of you love is, right? So, that's all I really had for you today as an introduction to IzzyMap. There's more that you can do, but that's the basics of creating an actual thing. And I hope that if you didn't create a model for today's session, you'll actually go try it now because it was really fun to have a really physical object to map on, even if it's this tall. So um, give that a try because the actual practice of doing it, even if it's in miniature, I think is really useful. So thank you again for attending. It always makes me feel so great uh, to be able to um, see you all here and uh, visit with you. So go home and play with IzzyMap and we will see you for the next Guru session. Oh wait, one last question. What about the grid? The grid. I'm not sure what you mean by the grid. There is a, I mean, do you mean that the on the output menus show alignment grid? You can show the alignment grid if you want to see a grid appear but in a projection mapping context, I don't know how much sense that makes. I hope I answered your question. All right, that's it. We're going to have, I hope you have a great weekend. Relax, play with Isadora, and I'll see you at the next Guru session. Good night.